Hello, and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I'm your host, Katie Helper, and I'm joined, as always, by... What's going on, everybody? It's Gabe Pacheco. How you doing, Gabe? Here, the resident Chicano dude bro. Gabe is the resident Chicano dude bro. We had a bunch of auditions. He made <laughs> it to the final round. Make sure that you join our Patreon, patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. You can get extra bonus tidbits. In fact, uh, we gave you such great stuff last week. Allegra Love, some tips on what to do if you're an immigrant, some tips on what to do if you want to support immigrants. I just like seeing uh, photos of our of people who support the show with the mug, mm. Katie Halper Show logo on it. Yeah, if you donate at the $13 a month level, we get a mug. You No, we, <laughs> we buy ourselves a mug to congratulate ourselves with the funds. Now, you get a mug. And we're really excited to announce that our next live taping will be April 12th at the Brooklyn Commons, which is 388 Atlantic Avenue. And our guest will be Matt Carp, historian of the U.S. Civil War era. His first book, This Vast Southern Empire, Slaveholders at the Helm of American Foreign Policy, explores the relationship between American slavery and American power in the decades before the Civil War. He also writes for Jacobin. So we have a great show for you today. You know, I always say that, but we actually really do. Yeah, today, a fantastic Fantastic. one. Fantastic. You know why? Tremendous. You know why? Because we're looking after you and your health. Yeah. Have you gotten a checkup today? No, not today. I All haven't right. done my daily checkup. All right. But we are talking to a doctor. His name is Adam Gaffney. He also writes for places like Jacobin and The Guardian. And in fact, he has two pieces hot off the presses that we're going to talk about. He's going to make the case, the very good case, for single payer. Wow. And when does this man sleep? Blogging, you know what? giving people checkups. Let's it's ask. Insane. Giving people checkups. That's like clearly your your like doctor's health checkups. That's, That's where what your they mind do. goes. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. I like the little uh, rubber mallet that you use to tap people on the knee, check the reflexes. Exactly. Yeah. What is that called? Does that have a uh, a name? It's a mallet. It is a mallet. Yeah, we're gonna call it a rubber mallet. Rubber mallet. Yeah. I, I'm gonna throw in some foot, some audio of my dad. My dad's a doctor. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And I asked him about single payer. Your dad, what do you think? Tell me about the Medicare for All. Is it doable? Yes. Why? Because it, you know, all the money that is now being spent to pay the insurance companies will be able to be spent on um, you know, patient care. You yeah, know, I was filming him. It was on Periscope on Twitter. Unethical filming. Oh, yeah, it was totally unethical, yeah. You got to get him to sign one of those forms, you know? I should. It was really, it was cute. I'll play it. I mean, there's only 4% of the uh, money involved in Medicare goes to uh, administration. In contrast, there's 30% from the insurance company. I didn't know that. How do you know that? In case you can't hear him, what he says is, I'm like, how do you know that about, about Medicare and Medicaid? He's like... I, Bernie told me. Bernie texted me. How do you know that? How? Bernie texted me. <laughs> no, really, how do you know it? And yeah. then I said, no, really, because I'm, I'm a doctor. I blah, 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 blah. I'm a psychiatrist taking care of chronically ill patients. Anyway, Gabe, you've been watching a new show on on Netflix. Oh, my gosh. Well, I just I watched uh, Iron Fist. I can't recommend it to anyone, but I had to. I just had to. Can you give us the premise? Anyone who doesn't have Netflix who's listening to this, uh, you guys really have been living in caves, scared of drone strikes. I don't know what's wrong with you. It's called Iron Fist. Yeah, it's just the latest in the Marvel franchise. I am the Iron Fist. What the hell does that mean? He's Danny Rand is uh, running around New York City. I'm Danny Rand. I've uh, been away a long time. And he's a kung fu master and he's got to fight a bunch of villains. Let's go. You don't belong here. Hey, so I just want to talk. Who are ninjas? There was a big uh, uh, hubbubaloo uh, around whether or not uh, they should have a white guy play the lead in a show about kung fu. Is he based on an Asian American character? Is that why there's a hubbubaloo, as you put it? Uh, I think it's because in the 70s they, they created him as a kid. Like, oh, kung fu was a big fu. deal. Right, right, right. The genre. Remember, right, everybody right, yeah. was kung fu fighting the song. Everybody was kung fu fighting. Huh. They said it was fast as lightning. You know, Marvel jumped in on the cash grab and was like, Got oh, it. snap, let's create a, a kung fu character. So, and what's his ethnicity? He's oh. a white man. Oh, he's white. He's got a moppy uh, do of blonde curls. Okay. They're like Asian or blonde hair, blue eyed, curly. Uh, Shir- they were like Asian man or Shirley Temple man. On the good ship, lollipop. 
lollipop. It's a sweet trip to a candy shop. Right, right. And they're like, why are you appropriating our culture by having this guy fight right. with our martial arts style? I don't know who's – when I say R, right. I don't know who I'm talking right. about. It's the royal R. <laughs> Uh, the thing I found most offensive was that he spent the last 15 years exclusively speaking Mandarin and, and on the show. Not Cantonese. He, yeah, not Cantonese. But you'd think that he would come back and just speak an accented English. Instead, he's just speaking just normal meat and potatoes, standard Eastern time English. You're saying that you wanted him to be speaking English with a, Chi- with a Chinese accent. <laughs> that would have been less offensive. I think. <laughs> just putting it out there, guys. I'm just going for the realism of if you're not raised here, you're going you're gonna to speak with, the, uh, with, with an accent. Right. Okay. So let's have him be actually a, someone who was lost in living immersed in another culture so, and then comes back. Got it. Where was he? He was in the Himalayan mountains studying yeah. with uh, Mandarin-speaking monks. Got it. Okay. And I don't think they were speaking him in perfect uh, English or Either. even like, right. yeah. So how did he learn He it? wasn't reading any Bronte. Right. He's not reading Dickens. Mm-hmm. All he's got is an iPod that's got hip-hop from uh, late 90s to early 2000s. And then these guys yelling at him in Mandarin while they beat him with sticks. That's true. He's being beaten with sticks. Gabe, it just, so listeners know, <laughs> Gabe, it just looked at me like it's true, le- legit, like, n- like annoyed that I wasn't believing you <laughs> as if this fiction thing was. You're shocked. Like my jaw dropped because I, the idea of someone being beaten while being spoken to in Mandarin for some reason, that's not Mandarin phobic. It just it turned you on a little bit. Well, it turned my empathy and concern parts of the brain on. Those were activated. So Gabe saw me with my jaw dropped, I guess, or like looking disgusted. You were like, we need to call child services. Yeah, basically. And, uh, he comes back to New York and he is now the CEO of his company. He's the heir apparent for the Rand Corporation. So when he's not uh, fighting ninjas, he's trying to give uh, affor- affordable pharmaceutical uh, drugs to third world people. See, it's all come, it's all related. It is all related, right? I really wanted to talk about the health care fiasco. You know, it's hilarious. So you know that Paul Ryan, they tried to pass this Trump care bill, right? Yes. And he couldn't do it. So he said, Obamacare is the law of the land. It's going to remain the law of the land until it's replaced. We did not have quite the votes to replace this law. He actually said, I don't know what else to say other than Obamacare is the law of the land. I I don't know what else to say other than what else could he say, Paul Ryan? He could be like, I don't know what else to say other than I have a widow's peak. I don't know what else to say other than I like working out. I don't know what else to say other than I look like which character does he look like from the Adam? Is it the Munsters or the Adams family? Just thinking next time he's he's at a loss for words, Paul Ryan. By the way, you guys know that Donald Trump's solution is to just let Obamacare explode. I don't know what that means, but I like the sound of it. The best thing we can do, politically speaking, is let Obamacare explode. It is exploding right now. It's uh, many states have big problems. Almost all states have big problems. I am still confused with the difference between Trump care, Obamacare and and why don't we have a single payer system well, yet? So we're going to talk to our first guest, Adam Gaffney. He's every Jewish mother's dream. Doctor, instructor at Harvard. Hello. Hi, Adam. Hi. Hi, Dr. G. Thanks for talking to us. You are talking to me and Gabe Pacheco. Hello. Hello, Gabe. How are you? I feel I feel well today. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Gabe's really nervous. You're trying to give him a checkup over the phone. <laughs> As Gabe just asked, how do you have time to sleep? You are an instructor <laughs> in medicine at Harvard Medical School and a pulmonary and critical care doctor at the Cambridge Health Alliance. Also, Gabe, you're going to like this, I bet. He's, a, according to his Twitter bio, he's an otter enthusiast. True. Yes. Whoa. Single payer advocate. Also very important. He, your website is the progressive physician dot net. I really wanted someone who was a doctor and had a policy critique because the arguments against single payer are often by people who pretend like, oh, I'm a, a policy wonk. You're, you're not an expert, Katie, or you're not an expert, Gabe, or you're not an expert. Bernie Sanders. You wrote two great pieces, one at just this week, guys. That's how prolific he is. One at The Guardian and one at Jacobin. And the one at The Guardian is called Trump Care is Dead. May it forever stay in its shallow grave. (laughs) Doesn't that sound a little Yiddish? May it forever stay. (laughs) It sounds like something a a revenge-driven mafioso might say. Or so Italian. Yes. May it forever stay in a shallow grave. I yeah. like it. Yeah. 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 Anyway, don't worry, Adam. We edit these podcasts, so don't worry. Okay. Yeah. 
Can you tell us your kind of hot take on the healthcare victory? It certainly was a good ending to this. It was a good weekend. The reality is, is that this, you know, Trump, so-called Trump care was really basically a bad version of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, It didn't, you know, they tried to speak about it as if it was some sort of revolutionary thing. Paul Ryan described it as a new form of health care freedom. And it was all nonsense. I mean, they basically took the Affordable Care Act, left a lot of it in place and just made it meaner, nastier and (laughs) uh, redistributed wealth uh, up to the rich. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars of tax cuts to people making over $250,000 a year and to healthcare corporations. And in order to fund those tax breaks, they basically cut Medicaid and cut Obamacare subsidies for people of low income. That's really the heart of it. That's what I said in the Jacobin piece. I said it would be like if you know, Scrooge rewrote um, the, um, Obamacare. So that's why in one of the pieces, I call it the um, evil, twin? evil cousin. Evil cousin. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, you call it the evil cousin. Sorry, the evil cousin. You are a doctor. You're very precise. You got to be precise as a doctor or else you can cut someone's <laughs> uh, heart out instead of uh, a tumor. But yeah, it was the, the evil cousin of Obamacare. Evil twin would have been overselling it because there are differences. But you um, point out that there's this interesting kind of conflagration of reasons that came together beautifully to to make Trump care impossible. And you say in your in your Guardian piece, the implosion on Friday attributable to some combination of the intransigence of the House hard right and an extraordinary lack of popular support and an impressive show of grassroots antagonism will prove to be a pivotal moment in healthcare history for at least two reasons. First, it is tantamount to a social rejection of the conservative health care ethos. Second, it may very well Open the door to more progressive fundamental health care change in the years to come. So it is interesting that this kind of brought together opposition from the right and the left. And I'd just like to take a moment to remind everyone who makes the argument that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are the same thing because they agree on certain things like TPP. If you want to make that argument, that's fine. But you're also making the very incorrect claim that people who opposed uh, Trump care on the left and on the right are the same. Okay, that's my hit, hit piece uh, against neoliberals. Okay. I concur. Thank you. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Gaffney can first. And so how do we move forward and actually bring single payer to reality, especially given that so many people like to say it's just a pipe dream? Right. I mean, the people who say that are the people who don't want it to happen. You know, I mean, we all do that, right? We claim something's impossible if we don't want to actually get around to doing it. And I often feel like, you know, it's impossible for me to do my dishes. You know, I just say it's not feasible. Like cleaning my room. Yeah. (laughs) No, but seriousness, yes. I mean, you know, first of all, something is going to be impossible unless if you believe it to be so. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, And second of all, it's not impossible. I mean, you know, again, the Gallup Gallup poll last year um, found that 58 percent of the country supports um, single payer. So it it takes almost a little bit of gumption to claim that something that the majority of the country wants isn't feasible. I mean, that says something sort of sad about the way democracy works, but but you shouldn't accept that in any event. So you say gumption, you know what I would call it, what these people have, chutzpah. Sorry, I had <laughs> they, to go. Both words work well. I was, yeah. I was, I was, yeah. I, I, that, that would probably work better, actually. Yeah, no, gumption's fine. We're this is a an interfaith, intercultural, uh, multicultural show. So I think that look, it's it's not going to be easy, but there has been a growing wave of support. Um, there's been a growing movement behind this that has come a long way. I mean, look, even after Trump Care imploded and went up in flames on Friday, I mean, what was the immediate reaction that you heard in, uh, from voices sort of across? the political spectrum was, wait, this is going to open the door for single payer. So, yeah. and, you know, I'm usually the one always making that argument. I didn't even need to make it this time because everybody else was saying the same thing. You saw it in columns. You saw it in, I heard it in conversations. Um, it's just been out there. So um, we can talk about sort of what we would need to do to actually make this happen, which is, you know, obviously a, a big question and, and it's going to be not easy. But um, I think there's no question that, it's, that, that it can be done. And I think we're already seeing movements coalescing behind the idea that this is, in fact, the last man standing. This is the the only option left. Some people, I think, really don't want it to happen. They oppose it politically. They are opposed to single payer. Then I think what happens is you hear it so much and the media doesn't challenge it that you have people who really don't have necessarily a kind of ideological dog in the race who parrot the point just because it sounds realistic. Oh, yeah, I, it's impossible. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's uh, we've never had it before. So it's impossible. So I do think there are two kind of people we need to we need to shame 
on one population and educate the other. I would agree with that. Right. There are a lot of people who just accept sort of the common wisdom that this is a nice idea, but it's, you know, not going to really ever happen. And we want to bring those people in for sure. People who are saying that it's not going to happen are uh, are they sort of just the mouthpieces for their financial benefactors? Like who are the invested parties that want to keep the globalists us from having single payer? So certainly I think um, – uh, obviously, the health insurance industry is not um, really going to go along with this. In fact, they're going to uh, fight it to the death because this would really decimate the private health insurance industry. So, and we should just be honest about that. And um, I don't think that's an insurmountable obstacle, but they are a force to be reckoned with. I mean, the Ameri- AHIP um, is a lobbying organization. They have a lot of money. They spend a lot on lobbying. They give a lot to politicians. Um, and so it's hard in individual cases to know why someone's against it, but there's no question overall that all the money that um, the insurance industry is pouring into Washington plays a role. Um, the pharmaceutical industry is going to be opposed as well, not to, to the same degree as the insurance industry. But, you know, one thing that's good about a, a single payer system is that you can negotiate down drug prices on a national level, which already happens in other countries. And, you know, you can probably bring drug, brand name drug prices down by about 50 percent that way. And so they're not going to be super keen on it either. So those are two and they're even probably more powerful than the insurance industry. So, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, um, money and a lot of uh, lobbying might and muscle. And so, yeah, why, you know, why do some politicians oppose it? It's, it probably differs from person to person, but overall that plays a role. I mean, don't forget Hillary Clinton famously said in the 2016 primary election uh, that uh, single payer would, quote, never, ever happen. Right. So that's a good example of, of sort of the never, ever side of things. Right. Campaigning on hope. Yeah, exactly. Hope and hope and uh, hopelessness and, and changelessness. There seems to like to be two issues determining whether something's possible. One is the political will, and as you as you showed, there definitely is the political will. It's a popular thing; people support it. The other thing is the financial thing. So what do you have to say to that, to the financial argument? We have the numbers, and they're on our side. So my colleagues recently published a paper, the Annals of Internal Medicine. They give some estimates of the savings of a single-payer system and the administrative savings alone. Um, because, you know, if you go to a single-payer system, sort of like Medicare, you can basically cut out a ton of uh, wasteful spending on billing, insurance, overhead, profits, all of this nonsense. They, you know, about $500 billion a year, it's estimated you could save through administrative savings. And then you toss in another hundred billion uh, in pharmaceutical savings, and then you're talking about you know real money at that point. Uh, so you know, if you take those that, that those amounts of money, you can use that to cover the cost of insuring everybody and of getting rid of copayments and deductibles and of expanding coverage uh, in new ways like dental care and long-term care and things that insurance often doesn't already cover. So it's ambitious. I mean, I'm not going to you know, what we're proposing uh, is an ambitious very, you know, sort of grand uh, and egalitarian new system. And it's going to cost money, but we have the savings on the other flip side. So I'm not worried about losing the battle over, uh, you know, the the, the wonk battle uh, in the realm of finances. Now, we we took a hit last year during, you know, when the during the campaign. I don't know if you remember, but there was this, you know, Bernie Sanders came out with a single payer sort of proposal, and then these, you know, estimates put out by the, a, a economist, um, and then everybody sort of jumped on that bandwagon, and Ezra Klein called mm. it, you know, a puppies and rainbow plan or something like that. I don't know if you remember this. I think I blocked it out. I PTSD. love puppies. I love rainbows. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That is a thanks, Ezra Klein. Way to sell Bernie's plan. So he he dismissed it. Where was Krugman on it? Don't tell me that. Krugman jumped on he this. did too. Of course he did. He did. Too. We need a Paul Krugman sound effect for every time we mention something horrible he did. What could it be? Like a really annoying noise. We'll figure it out. Gabe's on it. Gabe's really excited about this plan. Yeah. It was like a month in like winter of 2016 where like every, you know, liberal pundit basically said, aha. Bernie's, you know, numbers don't add up. Right, and right, right, right. It was right. a bad month. He but, doesn't know what uh, he's talking about. He doesn't have the specifics. He doesn't have the numbers. It's a pipe dream, blah, 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 blah. Exactly. Yeah, that was, right, yeah. 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 But you're saying the numbers were there. The numbers were there. That's correct. Right. right. They are. I mean, the savings are there. Really, I think we were sort of outnumbered and, and right. you know. No pun intended. There you go. I mean, it seems like that could also be a full-time job if you wanted to respond to the the myths that come from the even liberal media. It's so funny to say liberal media because, of course, that used to be a critique from the right, and now we're critiquing it from the left. But what would you? What are kind of the, the most annoying and most persistent myths 
I mean, the most annoying myths are, one, that it's unaffordable, two, that it goes against American values and so is impossible, three, that um, uh, it's too late, you know, we missed our opportunity to do this, four, that Canadians come to the United States, five, that these countries ration care, uh, I don't know, those are, those are five quick ones. Why do people say it's too late and, and why do you think that it is so viable now? Well, the right that... It would have been easier to do this 50 years ago. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, when the, when, the U, when the UK created its National Health Service uh, in 1946, yeah, I mean, there wasn't, the, uh, there wasn't this massive, powerful insurance industry. Um, there wasn't this mass, as massive of a powerful of a pharmaceutical industry. So sure, I mean, it would have been easier in some respects. That being said, um, you know, Truman did have a bill for sort of a, na- a single payer like national health care system, um, and that was defeated. Uh, and that was actually defeated by doctors for the most part. Mm. The American Medical Association went like total McCarthyite crazy wow. on it and, and sunk it and called it Leninist and, one, and so on and so forth. So there were opposition groups, but yeah, the argument that it that it would have been easier to do earlier is that you wouldn't have this whole apparatus that now you need to sort of deal with. But I think you know, whatever you can, we 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 can send people to the moon. We can create Medicare for all. It's really not that complicated. Not a single Democrat voted for it, right? And then you had these hardcore right wing people who felt alienated by the bill, and they mm-hmm. here's what they were upset about. You right? Conservatives contended that it would only be by eliminating Obamacare's various insurance regulations, including the one that requires that plans cover essential health benefits like hospitalizations, maternity care, and medicines, that premiums could fall. So they were upset that Trump care didn't cut things like hospitalization, maternity care, and medicine? <laughs> well, they, they would phrase it differently. Right. What they would say is that, to put it as you know kindly as possible, they would phrase it as, you know, you should have the freedom to buy the health insurance plan that covers your needs and, and what you want. And so Choice. there were all these multiple quips from people being like, why should men have to pay for, you know, mammograms and, uh, and prenatal care? And it comes from this sort of libertarian, I guess, notion that, oh, if health care insurance is a product like another product and you're buying a car, the government doesn't make you buy a uh, sunroof. So why should you have to buy coverage for contraceptives? That's sort of like argument. That's right. 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 And and you say they are not, I like this point that you make, you say they are not entirely wrong on that point. Skimpier plans are cheaper. Likewise, we could lower rents if landlords weren't expected to provide heat, running water, and a low risk of structural collapse. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's a good, I like that, that analogy. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where, this is why I'm hopeful as well for the future, because there's just such a massive disassociation between sort of the right wing healthcare ethos and what people actually think, who even even Republicans, right. um, you know, nobody really buys into this. I think people sometimes will make the argument in a selfish way, but overall people um, want comprehensive coverage. People want to have all of the me- their medical needs covered. In fact, most people are unhappy that they- more isn't covered. You know, I mean, that's what everybody complains about, right? Why am I co-payment so high? Why is this not covered? You know, and they're right. I mean, a lot of insurance sucks. So um, I think that, you know, I-, I put a Twitter poll a few days mm. before, or, I don't know, a week ago, and I kind of asked the question, why, why is the House Freedom Caucus, who is, you know, these hardline conservatives who sort of contributed to the bill spiraling into destruction, you know, why are they actually opposed to it? And the three things I mentioned were, um, one, trying to get more concessions, you know, just make it a little better for them. Two, that they're really true believers. Or three, they're just trying to disassociate themselves from what's going to be a disaster. And to be honest, I don't know what precise mix of, you know, of sentiments actually was behind them on an individual basis, because, you know, I wouldn't blame them for wanting, you know, they, it's possible they also just didn't want to be associated with this complete um, dumpster fire. That would be reasonable. But again, this was such an unpopular bill. The one poll that was widely cited put 17, you know, showed 17 percent of the public liked it. But my only point is, is that it is some combination of, of, of their beliefs, coupled with the fact that this was, in fact, a, a highly unpopular, detested bill. Why is it not just like any other business? You just said something about how, you know, why why should they be forced? Why should a, a, a sunroof car? Uh, I don't know anything about cars. Is that what you call it? A sunroof a convertible transformer? Why, why do, you're, you're saying why do cars as products uh, look different from, from other cars? No, from why do, why are, is health care not a uh, – why is a mammogram different from uh, a from a sunroof? Yeah. 
It's a good question. I'm, I'm being I'm being somewhat facetious, but you're you're a no, doctor, no. and I was raised my my dad is a doctor, and it's so funny because he is so <laughs> he's so disgusted by this stuff, you know, because I guess he and you take HIPAA seriously. But the idea that that the profit motive is behind taking care of people, I just think is is I don't think anyone wants that, even the people who think they want that. Because won't they just wind up be dying more than they would have if they're if the doctors actually cared or if the medical system actually cared? Because there are doctors who care. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think that I think healthcare, along with certain other sort of so, ba- social goods, um, we conceive of them in a different way. But I think there's a general philosophical sentiment. I mean, I think that they're not, um, you know, healthcare and education and, and a, number, a number of other things are not simply other commodity goods. I mean, you can make them into just one more commodity, um, but it's sort of a hellish result that you get from it. I mean, if you really made healthcare into simply the equivalent of a, a car, then that would mean that, you know, everybody who doesn't have a car today would be dying, right? right. Because they wouldn't be able to go to the doctor. People would be literally dying in the street. You could turn people away at, from hospitals. You can turn people away from emergency rooms. Now, that stuff already happens to some extent, not turning people away from emergency rooms, but people dying because they don't have insurance. Because they just don't go to the doctor. If they don't have insurance, they just won't see a doctor about their cough, which may turn out to be lung cancer. I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it. No, that's right. So, I mean, people will sometimes say, oh, you know, what are you so – people can always go to the emergency room. We don't let people die in the street. And that's true. There's a law that made it – I mean – the fact that we needed a law to actually make that illegal is, says something, but right. there's a law passed um, that prevented that. But um, yes, there's a lot of studies that have looked at the effect, the association of being uninsured and of being uh, of dying prematurely. And there's a body of literature supporting um, the notion that if you're that people want insured, why up dying? And if you cover more people, you actually save lives. So, you know, each study shows different numbers, but somewhere in the realm of maybe between 300 and 1,000 people you insure, you save one life per year. Wow. So, if you have you know 28 million uninsured, which is what the case is now, even with the Affordable Care Act, you know this probably tens of thousands of people dying a year that whose lives could be saved if we moved to single payer. Uh, and that's a sobering thought. And it also, you know, really brings home the idea that American health care is not already great and why the America is already great line did not really uh, work well for some people. Selfishly, I feel like uh, you can you could say, well, I'm less likely to catch a disease right. from someone else because uh, people are going to the doctor more often and they're going to be uh, getting treated for whatever ailments they have, and they're not going to be spreading those to the to everyone else. Yeah, you know, is like, that is that argument as well? Yeah, there's that. Yeah, Fr- Fran Lebowitz once <laughs> said, that "If your neighbor can't afford to take care of bed bugs, right, it's a yeah. public good for your landlord to to use pesticides." We can get into um, DDT a DDT debate later, but well, like I was a public school teacher, and every time a student came in and just coughed on everyone else with their mouth open because they couldn't stay home, their parents can't take oh, care yeah. of them at home. Uh, they're they're in the building, then they get the teacher sick or uh, the, all the other students, and then you have to come in every day because you don't have enough sick days. You're just getting everyone sick right. because you can't take the time. Next off. episode, we're going to do universal childcare. So we, you know, we've solved the problem with the kid being sick. They can stay home. We have sick centers that they can go to <laughs> yeah, so their parents can keep working. A sick house, yeah. Yes. Um, talking about Dickensian, as uh, Adam quotes. I think a sick center is called a, that's a hospital, I think. Oh, yeah, you're right. I, I was thinking more of a, of a poor house type of thing. <laughs> so we should have universal sick houses. Yeah, hospitals. exactly. You, you make a really important point in your Jacobin piece, Five Lessons from Trump Cares Collapse. By the way, I love this. I love when very complex, nuanced things, I'm not being sarcastic, are, are presented in listicle form. Because it really does get people to read stuff that they wouldn't otherwise read. I had a listicle last week on Friday about the African-American guy stabbed to death by the white supremacist who was just convicted, uh, just charged with terrorism. So that's good that he got charged with that. So you say in your Jackman piece, we should envision healthcare universalism along much broader and more egalitarian lines. The elimination of uninsurance, the end of cost sharing, and the creation of a single tier of coverage that provides equitable access to health care for all. For instance, as critically important as Medicaid is to the more than 70 million Americans who rely on it, we shouldn't forget that its participants sometimes receive segregated care or are relegated to the back of the line. Clearly, health care equity necessitates equitable health care coverage. And equitable systems save lives. As a widely reported study recently described, individuals with cystic fibrosis in Canada live on average an entire decade longer than their counterparts in the U.S. So 
this is also important because I think people always make the case, even to some extent, right? They, the assumption is that in this country, we don't have the rations or we don't have the problems that they have in countries with universal health, with single payer health. But as you were pointing out, there is actually, um, there is not a single tier of coverage. Right. And I think that, um, and look, I love Medicaid, and I, and I think it does helps an enormous number of people. And until we do something better, we absolutely should fight to maintain it and expand it. Um, but um, yeah, you, I mean, I think if you believe in uh, an idea of a right, okay, if you're going to take seriously that philosophical notion of a right, then it doesn't really mean much if you if if it's not associated with equality. I mean, I think equality isn't a word that we necessarily use that much. Um, but I think it's a word that has a lot of meaning when it comes to health care. You're never going to have perfect equality in terms of access because people will always be people who live farther from the hospital or whatever, and the things are going to be hard to fix. But if you want to work towards a real right to health care, then it, there needs to, it needs to be undergirded by, um, and, by, but by, the, by the idea of equality. And equality in health care demands having a level playing field, having a single tier, having a one-tier single-payer model where it's not poor person's medicine versus rich person's medicine. It's not you go to this hospital um, because they accept Medicaid and I go to the fancier academic center that doesn't take Medicaid but I, cause I have private insurance, and that happens, um, and that's not right. And the reality is is that even if the institutions, the safety net institutions are doing great work and are really helping um, poor people, it's not fair on the society level to have certain institutions taking care of um, uh, all poor people and having other institutions taking care of only wealthy people because you create this divide. And so, um, yes. I, I, to basically restate what I said, I think we do need uh, a more broad and egalitarian uh, conceptualization of healthcare equality and, and healthcare universalism. And I think having a, a single tier is the way to do it. And we know it can be done. You know, and we know that it actually, you know, probably reduces inequality in terms of health outcomes. And it probably helps over, uh, us all overall. I mean, again, the, the cystic fibrosis study that, that, you, that I mentioned that you just, you just read, that just came out a week or two ago, and they found that people with CF, uh, which is a you know, debilitating genetic lung disease that, that is often fatal or mostly fatal, uh, you know, that people live 10 years longer in Canada versus the United States. And not only that, they got uh, more lung transplants in Canada than they got in the United States, which, you know, we're supposed to be the reigning, you know, gods of high-tech care, right? That's like what's supposed to be our specialty. And what do you say to people when they say, oh, but, you know, if we have this here, you know, like the death panels, or they'll say, we're going to have people, uh, it's rationed, it's not good. I know of someone who lives in Canada. I have a friend who lives in England. All these anecdotal things. Um, what, right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you say to that? Yeah. I mean, so right, I hear a lot of those, and um, this, you know, it's like all anecdotes, right? I mean, there's anecdotes of how people lost, you know, Obamacare made them lose the health insurance, right? There's there's anecdotes of people who are unhappy in countries, and you know, one way to answer it is first of all, no system is perfect, and so I don't deny that people have had bad experiences with other systems. These are you're dealing with human beings, and you're dealing with, um, you know, different sort of um, uh, on the ground experiences. Anyway, so no system's perfect. My answer is as follows. Look, uh, we want to you take the best of what's in American healthcare now, and there are great things about it, and mix that and combine that with the best um, ideas that come from international examples. And, you know, between the two of those, we can actually have a really um, uh, superior healthcare system. Um, you know, some of this stuff is myths, though, too, Katie. Right. Um, uh, like, for instance, the whole Canadians coming to U.S. because they can't get health care in Canada thing. I don't know if you've heard that, but that comes up a lot. Yeah. And that's been actually – there's really no evidence for that at all. I mean, first of all, they, we, they couldn't afford it. I mean, if you wouldn't right. want to come to the United States and get like, a heart transplant, it would cost you like, millions of dollars. So I, I don't know who these Canadians are who have all this money that they can just – you know, instead of getting something for free, they can come to the U.S. for it. But uh, They're like it, nouveau riche. They like to show off their, their wealth. They're like, you there know you what? Go. I'm going to fly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my mm -hmm. jet to the U.S., I'm going to pay for a, a heart operation that I could get here for free. Yeah. yeah. It's, a way, it's a way to impress your friends. Keeping up with the Joneses. Where did you get your heart operation? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. exotic. Yeah. <laughs> Imported. What's up with Ezra Klein and Paul Krugman? Have they admitted to the errors of their ways, or are they still claiming that this is impossible? I, you know, I haven't been following their writing that closely in the last year. Uh, I think both of – my sense is that both 
think they sort of fall into the single payer is theoretically the best, but probably not feasible camp. Um, and um, so I, I don't know what they're saying now, but I think that's the camp they fall into. Um, that, you know, it has benefits. Yes, it would be good, but no, we can't do it. Um, but I think the thing that drives me crazy is that they are powerful pundits. You know, mm. their voice for better or for worse, has an influence and policy on Washington. So they are now actors in this game. So when they say, oh, health care, you know, single payer is great, but it's, but it's not doable, um, that really enrages me because they are contributing to its lack of doability because people, you know, respect, respect their columns. I mean, I, I don't want to overstate their importance in terms of, you know, Washington, but to whatever extent they matter, they are contributing to the infeasibility that they say is, um, inevitable, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. And I get really, I have to admit, I'm a little bit tired of my lefty uh, friends and peers and cohorts when I bring something up like uh, the role of pundits and they're like, who cares? These people don't matter. Nobody cares who Ezra Klein is. Nobody cares about Paul Krugman. And it's like, okay, fine, but then what's the point of media criticism at all? Like, do we really think this stuff has no effect at all? Yeah, I think you could, you don't want to overstate these people's importance, but I think, you know, they, of course they matter. If their voices don't matter, then it's hard to see how any media matters. So I, I really don't believe that. Also, I think in the discursive realm, um, where you're still wrangling over ideas, um, it does matter, right? So if you did have a sort of coalescing of voices that single payer is in fact doable, I think that would make a difference because I think it would help elevate it, uh, uh, you know, from it, – it, it, I think it would help take things forward. Now, we may never have that, but it doesn't mean that it's irrelevant. Right. I mean, that the whole thing is that, as you pointed out, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So the more people say it's a pipe dream, the more it sounds like a pipe dream. And and what is the, the status of – what is Bernie Sanders doing now? Sanders, obviously, longtime single-payer supporter, he has um, – in, he has had single payer bills that he has introduced in the past. Um, over the weekend, I think it was on CNN, uh, he said in response to the Trump Care fiasco, he was going to go ahead and reintroduce a new single payer bill. Um, and I think that helped uh, contribute to this overall you know, dialogue that's been brewing over the last few days, where single payer is increasingly being pointed to as the next step that the Democrats should take on. Um, so he is going to reintroduce that. He is a supporter. It, as we talked about earlier in the show, you know, this, the health care issue was a big um, part of the primary between him and uh, Clinton. Um, and, um, and so that's, I think that's a good, uh, important. Um, and I think it actually opens up a big area for activists because now we have all these Democratic senators uh, or Republican senators that we can pressure, right? Sign on to Bernie's bill. Why aren't you signing on to Bernie's bill? What, you know, what, what is your reason for not doing that? Uh, I think it's going to give us a good road, a good in, inroad for activism. Um, and then uh, Representative Conyers, he has had a single payer bill, H.R. 676, that he has introduced before, and he reintroduced it in uh, January. So we have a bill in the House currently, and Bernie is going to reintroduce a bill in the Senate. And I think having those bills out there, even if they lack enough sponsors, um, is important because it's, a, it's an important organizing focus, and it will help lead us into the realm of of actual policy once the once we can actually change the people who are in charge of the country. What difficulties or challenges have you encountered as a doctor because of insurance? Because we don't have single payer, basically. Mm -hmm. So I, I just speaking both from kind of myself and experiences of colleagues and things, you know, just sort of general impressions. And I, I should say right now, most of um, almost well, actually, really all of my clinical work now is in an ICU. So I, I don't really, I'm not really dealing dealing with a lot of this sort of um, interactions with insurance companies that say a doctor and like a private practice would okay. be doing. Right. Um, but that being said, just in terms of my overall sense of things and of my colleagues, um, I mean. Yeah, so there's huge problems. Uh, for instance, drugs, just to focus on one issue. Mm -hmm. Drugs are, there's been a big rise in drug prices. There's been a proliferation of extraordinarily expensive drugs, you know, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And there has been a rise in deductibles and co-payments. You know, a lot of insurance plans have these four tiers now. Um, and people skip, as a result, people skip their medications, you know, or they take um, a once, a, a, twice a day medications once a day, or they um, don't even fill the prescription to begin with. Um, there's like a heartbreaking story in um, NPR, 
either the last week or the week before it about people with cancer skipping therapies because they can't afford it. I mean, so, you know, you can see this from the inside, but you also can just, you, you can, you know, read about this stuff or experience it yourself so, uh, so easily. And it's terrible. And, um, you know, we don't need it. Again, uh, in the UK, with the exception of a minority of people in England only, they don't have any co-payments for drugs. So any drugs that you're prescribed by your doctor, you can fill for free. And we can do the same thing here. And it's, to some people, that's almost like a foreign idea, or it's like, not even foreign, but it sounds like something impossible. How could you give drugs for free? You know? right. And the reality is, is that you can because nobody really wants to take medication. So there's really no moral hazard of people just getting more because it's free. And so um, that's something that also is <laughs> – very contrary to the conservative healthcare ethos of, commodi- of, of commoditizing healthcare, uh, because it actually means we can have free healthcare, and I won't read to overuse. The last thing I'd add would be um, to sort of misquote John Lennon that uh, you know we can imagine a world without health insurance companies, and it's not um, it's not hard to do. And I think that once we ex- make that sort of ex- accept that logic, I think the um, the feasibility of this whole approach becomes clearer. And uh, the last thing I'd say is that um, as difficult as hell, eh, you know what, forget this. No, I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm what, what? I can take it off <laughs> what if it's gonna, not good. So uh, what I was going to say is I think the key thing, someone could, someone could make the critique, what, why are we possibly talking about single payer right now? Uh, you know, Trump is in office. Congress oh, is controlled right, by think, Republicans. Right. What chance in hell do we have of doing this? And my response would be this. Look, this is the time that we coalesce around a policy, make the Democratic Party take on that policy, and be ready so that when there is a turn in power, um, when there is a change in government, we can actually make this happen. And so that, I think, is a sort of long-term or medium-term strategy. That's really important, I think, because exactly, there's this liberal myth or lie, unclear which it is. Um, I think it varies from person to person. But the idea that it's because of Trump's extremism that this is the this is the last thing we need, right, is to do something like this. But again, it's actually precisely a politically strategic thing to do, right? You have people disgusted by this Trump thing. And look what you have happening. You have these people who used to tell, uh, who used to say, get government out of my Medicare, right? These same people are really angry because they see on a really concrete level how getting rid of Obamacare will kill people, right? They'll kill their husbands, their wives, their kids. I mean, you basically have the people who were saying stuff about death panels and didn't really make a lot of sense uh, under Obama. You have the same – a lot of the same people and they're making actually coherent arguments that are grounded in their own experience and in kind of life and death uh, because they realize what the effect will be. I, I don't know, again, if it's if it's dishonesty or if it's a lack of understanding, but the idea and, of course, the entire, let's call them Vox takes, they're not always in Vox, but there is the whole Vox takeocracy that is obsessed with the idea that, you know, universal programs or moving to the left just won't help. And uh, they have this weird, like, logical fallacy that, because racism can get in the way of people supporting universal programs, like we just can't have universal programs and that they don't realize that actually universal programs can help help mitigate racism because they're less uh, stigmatizing. Mm-hmm. That was more of a rant yeah. than a question. No, but, well, I agree. And yeah. I think that actually I think what I think is so good about what I think is wonderful about the single payer universal health care campaign and goal, apart from the fact that it's sort of my field, but I, I do care about other issues. But the reason why I, I think it's, it, it is so critical is A, because so many lives are on the line, B, because it is a unifying sort of potentially unifying issue. People want more health care, not less. They want to take, they want their parents and their children and themselves to be taken care of. And it's, it, it's, it's an issue with real, um, that, that can really unify people. Um, and three, it really is a way to, um, Take, move against a lot of other forms of oppression in society, mm. including racism. You know, having that single tier with everyone have, having equal access, is that going to eliminate racism in medicine or healthcare and racial inequality? No, but it's going to help. It's going to be a step in the right direction. How so? so well, I mean, for the simple reason that, um, segreg- you know, to, to use the, the famous line, uh, separate... Um, mm, not equal. Yes, exactly. Uh, so you can have, you know, um, so in... in, in as things currently stand, for instance, as we talked about with Medicaid, you you know there is healthcare segregation. There are whole institutions that don't take Medicaid, and so um, you need to be have at least a, an 
equal access uh, and a single tier of access to give people the potential to have um, uh, equal outcomes. Um, and so I think that a single payer system giving one big network with all doctors and hospitals included, people could go to the one they wanted to, not the one that their insurance takes, would be an important step against racial injustice in healthcare. By the way, yeah, that's I love that that straw man argument. How how dare you say that um, single payer will heal will eliminate every single form of oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia. You are such a straight white cis male uh, class reductionist uh, vulgar Marxist. That's your that's you get to make a t shirt that says that. I have that t shirt running. Oh, there you go. Take a picture so I can get it made up for myself. You know, it's funny, I, I was on someone else's podcast and they're libertarians and he said that like a third of deaths are preventable what's the, the the genre, like preventable injuries, like you get from bed sores? A third of deaths are preventable. Um there is the so, I mean, that's a whole, that's right. a really whole big other issue. But I mean, I think that's referring to like evidence about um, sort of medical error related deaths, I'm guessing. Medical errors, right, right. Yeah. But it seemed, I mean, his point was that like, and that's why we don't need health insurance. Like it's, a, you know what yeah, I mean? It's that's this, a... <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, I mean, okay, that uh, that would be a little bit okay. Even even putting aside, I mean, there's a whole argument about that literature and whatnot. We can, but that's a right. separate issue. But, right. but I mean, that would sort say. of be like saying, well, unsafe school. If it's like, if I found like right. an unsafe school, that I should say we shouldn't have schools. Exactly right. How how much? By the way, we got how much has Bernie led to this? By the way, how much has Bernie Sanders brought this out? as a viable thing. Can't give, put a percentage on it, but he has played an important role, yeah. unquestionably. I mean, I think um, the campaign last year, um, even though, you know, given how close he got, I mean, that put single payer in a major way back on the map, right? Um, and that helped to invigorate um, the activists and, and, and this overall national discussion. Although people have been working on this and, you know, I don't think we should take away, you know, from any, you know, give him too much credit, but I, I think he's played a major role. And then I think um, he seems like he's ready to play a role again by um, putting a new bill out there and, and helping to contribute to the national discussion about this. He, I mean, articulated, right. And put it out there. I think put out something that a lot of people were feeling. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think the fact, I mean, it's sort of like the whole, it goes back to the whole argument about like, uh, you know, did, uh, was Bernie Sanders, you know, that even Bernie Sanders relative success in that primary was that due, you know, he was saying the same thing for a long time, but the su- situation changed in a way that allowed what he was saying, um, to be, gra- you know, to be sort of grasped by a larger percentage of the population than had been in the past. So I think it's, there's two sides to the coin. It's, it's, there has been a shift in politics, there has been a greater acceptance of left-wing politics. The fact that he's able to call himself a democratic socialist right. and not be run out of town and almost, you know, become president is, you know, a pretty um, astounding development in American politics. And so um, I think he's playing an important role, but I think the grassroots movements are also playing critical roles. And I think, uh, you know, putting all these elements together is going to ultimately bring victory. Right. Okay. And any insights into why why the political uh, climate has changed? Like why now? Well, good question. I think that um, I think that following the sort of neoliberal turn, the move to the center of Democrats, the you know triangulation approach of Bill Clinton, the whole sort of you know years and years of of sort of neoliberal policies that have created a lot of suffering, but also have provoked a counter reaction from uh, from the left, and so you know. Beginning with, you know, say Occupy Wall Street, this how much, you know, uh, attention the issue of inequality began to have. So I think what we're seeing now is the result of um, years of activism and of greater awareness of the inequality that has resulted from, um, you know, basically neoliberalism. That was a, that was a vague sort of no, it was good. It was good. <laughs> we gotta, as you said, strike while the iron is hot. You wrote that right in one of your pieces. Did I? Did I? I, I did say that. I can't claim to have coined that phrase, however. Oh, okay. I was about to, to write a whole piece about how you invented this new term. Oh, well, there goes my writing career. Strike while the stethoscope is hot. That would be very painful, though, and not good. Yeah, that, I think that would be mixed. That would be almost like a Tom Friedman-esque like, like mixing of metaphors. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's interesting. I just want to, as a final thought, like healthcare, I think, really does have the ability to galvanize people from who have different ideologies because I think life and death really does cut through a lot of that stuff. 
Like you may be – Chris Matthews once – I have to find it. I'm trying to find it. But I remember watching uh, Hardball and he said, everyone's a libertarian until they get a stroke, until they have a stroke, which I thought was a pretty apt thing to say. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. It, it has a unifying, galvanizing effect. I mean, even that poll, that Gallup poll I mentioned, 40 percent of Republicans said they were in favor of single payer, right? right? I mean, so that's pretty astounding. So yes, I think that there is a general, even even people, even I think like right wing sort of right leaning physicians, for instance, are uncomfortable with the idea of a sort of corporate profit driven healthcare system. Um, and I think that. Um, no one wants to think that the end, the reason why they're being treated or not treated a certain way is for some corporation's bottom line. Right. And so I think it does. There is a unifying element to, to healthcare that um, you know is going to improve our likelihood of actually achieving what we want to achieve. Yeah, and it also is one of the few things that you really can't protect yourself from, right? Because I think like if you have a healthcare system that's based on profit, even when you have really rich, fancy people and they get better treatment, it's still kind of corrupt the the I was going to say industry, but I don't the field right. It turns it into an industry. So, yeah, so. and 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 I think that even people who have good health care, I think, are uncomfortable with the idea of some sort of corporatized health care medical industrial complex. Uh, and there's you know the whole all that evidence pointing to the fact that unequal societies and uh, you know is a book the spirit level um, that describes how or sort of synthesizes all this literature about how. Uh, inequality in society itself, this is sort of slightly a bit of a tangent, but inequality in a society in itself leads to less healthy societies that um, for a variety of reasons, um, when you have huge differences between rich and poor, um, it actually cuts the very bedrock of society in a way that leads to more social uh, pathology, to more mental health uh, problems, to more physical health problems. And so I think health is a really, is sort of at the center of so much of that we talk about in politics. Um, and really, there's not an issue that doesn't in some way pertain to health, ranging from climate change, education, policing, um, all, the thing, all the issues that are, that are critical to us um, on the left, uh, they all pertain to health in some way. And so health care is one part of that larger struggle. Um, it's what I focus on because it's what I have the greatest proximity to. But um, clearly, there are many other things that we need to do to make a healthier society beyond just universal health care. But that being said, universal health care is a critical element um, in a more just society. Well, thank you so much, Adam Gaffney, and um, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was a really enjoyable conversation. Me too. Us too. Bye.